yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The idea of attacking uh, Pearl Harbor was never anything more than a raid whose purpose was to temporarily knock out uh, the American fleet. It was never to invade uh, the Hawaiian Islands. They had no manpower to do that. They had no resources. They did not have transports. That was never part of their plan. The idea was merely to, to uh, knock out the fleet for a period of time until they had placed themselves in a position to negotiate on grounds of their choosing. The truth of the matter is we didn't know how to fight a war. The first year of the war was a big learning experience for the U.S. Navy. We learned from the Japanese and what, how to fight a war. The devastating Japanese attack on the Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor was only the opening act in a tide of conquest that swept through the Pacific. America had planned an ambitious building program for its overseas possessions in the 1920s, but skillful Japanese diplomacy had halted that. The Washington Naval Conference and succeeding naval conferences in the 1920s and 30s. They're, they're one of the most successful examples of arms reduction in history. There's not very often that there's been a conference that results in armed forces uh, literally destroying their weapons of war. Uh, but it uh, had enormous implications for American defense policy because it prohibited the fortification of uh, possessions in the Pacific. Although the, the Japanese accepted that, um, that they still felt that they got something of the, the short end of the deal from the, from the naval treaty. Um, because of this re restriction, they were not allowed to build a navy as large as the United States or the Brits. What the Japanese wanted in return, okay, for signing this naval treaty, and which they got, was an agreement by the United States that we would cease work on building any additional fortifications on our possessions in the Western Pacific, i.e. in the Philippines, in Guam, in Wake Island. And of course, when the Japanese launched their expansion in, in late 1941, the fact that we did, did not have any additional fortifications in those places only made the, the Japanese take over in, in occupation. That, that much easier. Guam was to be America's fortress in the Far East. However, Guam fell after only token resistance to overwhelming Japanese forces. There was no Pacific Fleet to come help them. They resisted briefly. Once the Japanese got ashore, the fighting lasted less than a couple hours, and the commander wisely decided to surrender to avoid further bloodshed. They never had a chance. Further west, the small marine garrison on tiny Wake Island fiercely resisted the Japanese. On December 11, 1941, the Japanese actually tried to land on Wake Island with a force of overage destroyers and light cruisers to support a special Navy landing group. Well, the Marines were waiting for them with shore batteries, five-inch shore batteries, and they waited until the Japanese closed to within really point-blank range before opening up. Well, the fire was so intense that the Japanese pulled out and retreated, and at that point, the surviving aircraft from VMF-211 attacked the retreating Japanese and sank two of their destroyers. This was the only time in the entire history of the Pacific War that an amphibious operation had been driven off by an island's defenses. The heroism of the tiny garrison gave America some hope in those dark days. Their stand prompted a half-hearted relief effort by the shaken U.S. Navy. Wake Island, I thought it was bravery of the first magnitude. 
down to one or two planes and taking on the, the Japanese fleet, so to speak. And I thought that they were left out there to die, which they were. We tried to get a strike off to reinforce Wake without success. We did, at that message, get a message that said roughly, enemy on island, issue in doubt. Without support, the island fell to the Japanese on the 23rd of December. Two days later, Hong Kong fell to a Japanese assault after over two weeks of resistance by British Commonwealth forces. Despite having been at war with Germany for over two years, British forces in the Pacific were just as unprepared as the American military for the outbreak of war with Japan. It was uh, very easy, like a days ago, if you like. We didn't really do much in the way of, of uh, outstanding uh, fighting training. The Japanese invasion of Malaya had occurred so rapidly that the British had been unable to react other than to fall back to more defensible terrain. So confused were these early days of the campaign that the British gave up the airfields in the north without destroying them, a mistake they found difficult to remedy later. We uh, attacked enemy-held airfields in northern Malaya by bomb, by bombing raids at night from about 10,000 feet, carrying uh, 10, 500 pound bombs. Not particularly effective because uh, I don't think our bombing skill and accuracy was very great. We had not done much in the way of practice and that sort of thing. Each successive British position was outflanked and driven back by the Japanese who came on in a determined jungle version of Blitzkrieg. The British never recovered. Their resistance in Malaya was confused and served only to delay, not halt, the determined Japanese approach to Singapore. The British force was poorly trained, new troops raised in India and Australia. It was not well led, their communications were not good, their aircraft were few and obsolete. And they were under constant air bombardment, regularly being outflanked, being threatened with being surrounded, and British morale plummeted rapidly. Um, in almost no time at all, the Japanese managed to chase them completely out of Malaya down into the fortress of Singapore. They were equally unable to significantly interfere with Japanese air raids over the city and its defenses. A somewhat hopeless time, unbelieving really that the enemy was coming down the peninsula through the jungle and through the plantations and totally frustrating time because nothing could be done about it. The Brewster Buffalo couldn't cope, which was a so-called fighter. and. Uh, when we got the hurricanes, they were great, except that the early warning system didn't get them up, at, up aloft in good time to be above the Japanese coming in. Um, we had no system, no scheme at all to speak of to, would say, stop them, because we'd never been trained that way, never thought along those lines. After a lightning campaign, the veteran Japanese troops, who were outnumbered by the British, closed in around Singapore. Only a narrow strait separated them from their ultimate goal. The stunned British attempted to defend Singapore, but it was a flawed fortress. We all realized what wonderful guns there were in the naval head, in the area of the naval base facing the sea, and that was the, the threat. None of us ever thought for one second of anything coming from the inland. It's a myth that Singapore's defenses were sighted only to point at the sea. Strong points in the guns were actually uh, sighted so they could be trained inland or to the inland approach. The problem was that the majority of the ammunition that they had for their guns was armor-piercing and not high explosive. Armor piercing is not good against uh, troop type targets. Now, the other difficulty that the British had at Singapore was the shore of the island is some 30 miles long and General Percival chose to try to defend the whole shoreline. 
So his battalions were spread over uh, a frontage of about a mile apiece, which is way too much for one battalion to cover. General Yamashita, the Japanese commander, soon threw his forces into a bold assault across the last natural barrier. In a short, vicious fight, the Japanese seized the city's reservoirs, and it was over. By mid-February, Singapore was gone, captured by the seemingly invincible Japanese. The loss of Singapore was a major shock to the whole Allied world, and of course, especially to the British Empire. It was one of the most humiliating defeats the British had ever suffered, having 100,000 men surrender to 30,000 Japanese troops. The approaches were now open for an invasion of Australia or attacks into the Indian Ocean. Almost alone in a rising flood of Japanese conquest, the U.S. forces in the Philippines held on and hoped for the fleet and reinforcements they had been promised would come. Every day they tell us that something's coming, they're coming in, some, some airplanes are coming in, pilots to help you, and the Navy's going to be in and so forth, but they weren't, they didn't plan on it. They gave up. Three years would pass before they came, too late for many of those holding on in those first months of 1942. The privation and hardship that lay ahead for the Philippines seemed unthinkable just months before. Already promised independence by the United States, most Filipinos looked forward to the future. However, the Commonwealth of the Philippines lay between Japan and the natural resources she needed to feed her war industries, resources they were going to war to capture. The Philippines lay in the path of conquest. It was hoped that the Philippine Islands would be largely self-supporting in terms of defense. The American government uh, uh, promoted and uh, supplied a uh, Philippine army and hoped to eventually create even a Philippine Air Force so that the uh, nation could look out over after its own interests. It must be remembered that the United States had already promised the Filipinos that they would become independent. I believe it was 1946 was the date on the calendar. And so at the time of World War II, we had already taken measures to try to give them some sort of self-defense capability. Uh, the American contribution uh, to the Philippine defense consisted uh, not only of ground troops and of air forces, but of commanders. The only field marshal in American military history was Douglas MacArthur who after his first retirement from the U.S. Army uh, was actually the field marshal of the Philippine Army. By mid-1941, the threat of war hung over the Far East, and so General Douglas MacArthur, already in the Philippines as an advisor, was recalled to active duty with the grandiose title of Commander United States Army Forces Far East. Once in command, he set about changing the war plans and building a Philippine army. However, although the United States was not yet at war, Washington had already decided on the strategic necessity of defeating Germany first. This had caused the War Department to virtually write off the Far East in order to concentrate scarce resources on Europe. MacArthur, however, was not the sort of person to accept others' decisions especially when those decisions relegated his command to a back seat. General MacArthur goes out to the Philippines after he uh, finishes his uh, term as chief of staff and uh, takes uh, charge of the uh, development of a Philippine army. He will uh, also be uh, in on the developing plans for the defense of the Philippines. To plan, to expect, to uh, look forward to, of course, does not replace um, uh, the limited manpower available and the limited resources available, and MacArthur is persistently asking for more. Not a lot is going to be forthcoming. Uh, there are some increments that are uh, sent to the Philippines and several other places in the uh, Pacific. The general argued that with minimal reinforcement, not only could he hold the Philippines, but that the archipelago could be an advance base, the springboard for offensive action. 
Yielding to his persuasion, the War Department sent some of the limited numbers of modern B-17s and P-40 fighters to the islands. The die was cast, however, and they would be too little and too late. Time had run out for the Philippines. War came with the news of the attack on Pearl Harbor. All American planning had predicted that the first attack would fall on the Philippines. People ask me, uh, well, did we know the war was coming? And uh, I would say yes, because in, I think in October, they issued us a 45 and a steel helmet and a, a gas mask. And for us to get out of the barracks, we had to have those on, or had to have them with them. We'd, but uh, before they let us go in, they told us that if that siren goes, it's a real McCoy, we're not having any dry runs. We knew they were coming. We didn't know when, but we knew they were coming. But we never figured that Japan was any threat uh, because they weren't big enough to take on the United States. But we didn't realize that they destroyed the whole fleet and everything in Pearl Harbor. Despite the preparations and warning that bright December morning all over the islands, startled Americans came to grips with a war whose reality was suddenly upon them. The uh, first indication I had that there was really something happening was I looked up and I saw a silver airplane and uh, he had uh, red emblems on his wings. We get a call from the base to the house and one of the other pilots answered it and uh, they told us to report out to the base right away. But he didn't wake us up, he said. <laughs> Every time the Japs looked cross-eyed, we get on alert. So he said, forget it. <laughs> so we, we went out later on in the day, he lazily, and we had, found out then that the war had started. We saw them as they flew over and were completely stunned. We had no idea such a thing could happen. These first waves of Japanese attackers ignored other installations and went directly for the airfields around Manila. You know, we see these big bombers, you know, the big bombers, you know, four engine stuff, stuff. And they were way up high, you know. I didn't pay any attention to them for a minute, and I took a back look at it, and here are big old meatballs on them, you know. And we're watching them. We're going along watching these things, you know. And nobody's paying any attention to them. And they were heading across right over Manila, very low. And uh, they didn't do anything. They just kept coming. Jeez, he drops these bombs, you know, and they're coming down, and you can see them. And pretty soon you can hear them. Nichols Field, just down the way there. And the first thing you know, that was just billowing black smoke. 54 bombers, I guess, came over and bombed, per, bombed Clark Field. And I don't think they did too much damage. The fighters came in later and strafed. They were the ones that did the damage. They said, we're going to have to land some paratroopers, and that scared us all to death. A bomb made a direct hit real close to me, and I could feel a heavy impact on my back, and I thought I had really bought a big one. It scared the living daylights out of me, but didn't do any permanent harm. Despite several hours' warning, General MacArthur's Far Eastern Air Force was caught largely on the ground, parked as if ready for a peacetime inspection instead of dispersed for war. And I don't know why, because we had had warning that the planes from Japan were alerted and uh, probably were going to attack. As the tensions rose between the United States and Japan, everyone expected the first blow to fall on the Philippines, America's protectorate in the Far East. And so it was a great deal of surprise that the first attack actually occurred in Pearl Harbor against the Pacific Fleet, where America's strength was positioned. And it was only some eight hours later when the Japanese airstrikes that were delayed in Formosa because of weather arrived over the Philippines and found the American Air Force, who'd been up flying around in a protective posture, had landed and gone to lunch and parked their airplanes wingtip to wingtip. So the Japanese uh, aviators, expecting to fly into this hornet's nest of an American Air Force, uh, found instead this juicy target on the airfields and uh, destroyed most of MacArthur's Air Force on the ground. At the outset of the war, the B-17s should have been used to go after the airfields, Japanese airfields in Formosa, and they weren't. And there's still uh, 
arguments over who was responsible for not ordering the bombers to do that. Uh, another problem was during the attack on Clark Field, there were American fighter squadrons airborne flying combat air patrol, but they were flying over Manila Bay. They weren't anywhere near Clark Field. So the bulk of American uh, bomber power in the Pacific was actually destroyed on Clark Field because they had misused their air assets. MacArthur had seemingly done little with the time he was given by the delayed Japanese attack. In spite of his offensive vision, no strike had been ordered against the Japanese. As they had throughout their initial attacks elsewhere, the Japanese attacked the airfields in an attempt to secure air superiority for their invading forces. These initial strikes were devastating to the newly arrived units that were not fully ready for combat. A lot of our airplanes were damaged or totally destroyed, and hangars were on fire. We took an awful beating there because uh, they weren't equipped for it. The Japanese intelligence on American defenses was excellent. Once the airfields had been attacked, other installations became targets for the marauding Japanese planes. Uh, there were so many flights of Japanese airplanes and stuff going over there that uh, the air warning wasn't worth any good at all because there'd be a flight of them here and a flight of them there all over the Philippines. And, uh, uh, all day there, the, the Japanese airplanes were uh, 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 knocking everything out. We was getting an air raid, you know, a couple of times a day. Well, the alarms would go, you know, and we'd back out, and just back out and set it on the bottom, you know, to cover the boat until the air raid was over, and then we'd surface and come back in. The fury of these strikes woke the Americans and Filipinos from their stupor, and they attempted to strike back, crippled as they were. The American fighters in the Philippines were overwhelmed almost immediately because the pilots themselves did not have the experience to compete with the Japanese, who were all combat veterans. Many of the American pilots had never even fired their guns, and some had just gotten into P-40s and P-35s and were fresh out of training command back in the States. The other issue was the fact that the aircraft themselves had a low serviceability rate because there was no great logistical support for the fighter units in the Philippines. There just weren't the parts available to keep the birds in the air. The Japanese Zero was the airplane that the fighter had. Very, very, uh, very good airplane. It, it would uh, turn very fast and go very fast. We had trouble with them. They had us beaten. Most of the ships of the hopelessly outnumbered American Asiatic fleet had withdrawn out of the range of Japanese planes. We left Manila, I believe it was November 25th. Everything left Manila, except, you know, uh, auxiliaries and submarines, and we were scattered. While the Navy's scattered deployment largely saved them from the fate suffered by the Far East Air Force, it also meant that they were unable to immediately strike back at the approaching Japanese fleet. Some historians have argued that the Asiatic fleet's surface component could have done better than it did. The surface fleet never had a chance, and if you look at it, they fought in the Philippines and the Dutch East Indies. And where was the main Japanese effort in the early portion of the war? the Philippines, Malaya, and the Dutch East Indies. So this little tiny appendix of a fleet, an American fleet, was basically facing the entire combined might of the Japanese Imperial Navy and their Naval Air Force. They never had a chance. The Navy's submarines slipped out of Manila to take the war to the Japanese. And we ended up on, in uh, Marvelous Bay. So then we ended up doing, doing patrols up around Lingayen Gulf. And uh, then they laid a bunch of mines out there. And we, when we come in and out, we had to go through them. And uh, the last time we went out, I'll never forget, we were submerged after we got out past Corregidor. And you could hear them 
rubbing the cables of the mines, bouncing along the side of the ship. But the mines were bombs, see. But it's, you really had to know what to do to get through those. War had come like a lightning bolt from the sky. The sudden shock of going from life in a tropical paradise to fighting for their lives against an enemy which had been the object of contempt and was now seemingly unstoppable was too much for some of the Americans. When we were up there in these patrols, we looked around every once in a while. And here was just like a forest of trees, the whole Japanese fleet coming in. And uh, then the exec called the old man. And uh, he came up and he looked at it and uh, he just stood there. He said, take her to 300 feet and rig for depth charge. He could have fired all of his torpedoes and expended them all and got, sh got shots, you know, got good shots. But he didn't. Of course, that's when we went back into Manila Bay and he was relieved by another fellow. At the same time, the surface ships of the Allied fleets encountered the new realities of war. From there on, we uh, convoyed a lot of ships that were coming down from the Philippines, from China, wherever they came from. Trying to, they all went south, of course. And then the Prince of Wales and the Repulse came out there, and two days later, they were sunk. And when Prince of Wales and Repulse, the two huge battleships, arrived, we knew that the war was going to be won. However, what we didn't know was the capability of the Japanese Air Force to destroy those ships. It kind of concerned us, you know, they, if they can sink a couple of big ones like that, what, what kind of a chance do we have? Because we were, you might say, at their mercy because what we had didn't amount to much. In fact, though, that's the day that it was destroyed, sunk, I was sent out to a position where she was supposed to have been, and I found nothing. I noticed when I was flying out, a destroyer coming in with huge numbers of people on board, and I wondered something must be evacuated somewhere, and I was, to, I was there to prove that the ship had been sunk, both the Repulse and the Prince of Wales. Seriously outgunned, lacking effective air support, and badly in need of maintenance, the ships of the Allies attempted to hold back the Japanese with reckless courage. Their skipper had gotten the crew together, and he said, men, he says, we're in not the best situation out here. He said, at any time we could encounter a Japanese man of war. He says, if we can outrun her, we will. But if they have us outgunned and can outrun, he said, we'll sail right towards her, make as small a smaller target as we can. We'll sail in beneath her guns, and we'll close and board her. <laughs> there were four destroyers led by the John D. Ford, and uh, they went in a uh, surprise early morning attack in uh, Balak Papin. Convoy was coming through, landing troops, I guess, and uh, they went in, made this attack, and came out. And. Uh, we were supposed to fall in behind them, and if uh, they were chased, then we were supposed to be protecting them, but nobody chased them out. I guess they were such a surprise to the Japs. This successful strike by obsolete destroyers on the transports led to swift and decisive action by the Japanese against the gathering Allied fleet. I think it was around uh, about 10 o'clock in the morning when they spotted these Japs coming went to battle stations, and uh, my battle station was a Ford Battle Repair just before the officer's wardroom. And uh, they made, uh, I don't know how many runs they made on us, and finally they, they hit us. We took uh, two direct hits and one near miss. We took uh, one hit just after the superstructure, the bridge, and then one in the uh, back aft, uh, in the steering engine room. We were in a hard left turn, and uh, that uh, damaged the steering engine, and the rudder was jammed. And uh, then we took a near miss, tore a big hole there. That's what almost sunk us, I think. And that's when uh, I became a casualty. <laughs>
Under nearly constant air attack and engaged by superior Japanese fleet elements, the outgunned Allied vessels suffered horrific damage. I was supposed to go on the, on the uh, light cruiser, the Trump. And uh, the Trump came in that day, I mean, and it was to, uh, had an encounter with a Japanese battleship. It was badly damaged, but came in and was able to, on his own uh, uh, power, and uh, we had to remove and uh, some of the many bodies that were, all these boys were killed. And it really, as an 18-year boy, I mean, young man, I mean, it scared the living day out of me for the first time because, and I saw these bodies, I mean, that they had to put on the trucks and uh, remove them from the ship. One by one, the valiant remnants of the Allied fleet were damaged or sunk in battles with the Japanese naval and air forces bearing down on the Dutch East Indies. While the combined Allied fleets had tried valiantly to hold off Japanese invasion forces throughout the Far East, their efforts had been in vain. The Japanese came ashore virtually at will. As early as December of 1941, invasion forces landed at many places in the Philippines. The government called us and said, you must get the women and children out of there right now. The Japanese have landed 80 miles north of you, and they're headed your way. General MacArthur had changed the defensive plans to defending forward and denying the Japanese a landing. Unfortunately, the Japanese landed halfway up Lingayen Gulf, not where the Americans had expected, and met little resistance. The American defenses began to come apart. And when the uh, Battle of the Beachhead failed, uh, the uh, Americans and Filipinos were unable to evacuate effectively back to their original defensive lines around Manila Bay. One of the reasons that starvation and disease took such a toll among the defenders of the Bataan Peninsula and of Corregidor Island is that a lot of the supplies had been moved forward to support the beachhead battle and were, not, were never brought back when the troops retreated. General Jonathan Skinny Wainwright, the commander of the Northern Luzon Force, conducted a delaying action. The Philippine scouts fought ferociously. The, the Philippine scouts were a group of soldiers that were Filipinos that had American officers and, and they, they were there from uh, probably the time the Americans had the, uh, from the Spanish times. And the, the father and son and everything, it was a family affair. And, and all they'd done was train and, and uh, infantry, uh, uh, cavalry and stuff like that. And uh, uh, they, they were very, very good. They were probably some of the, uh, a group of the finest soldiers in, in World War II at, at that early time. And uh, they had a cavalry that when uh, the tanks were going from uh, southern Luzon up and across to get to Bataan, uh, they, they, and their cavalry was on horseback, and the Japanese brought uh, tanks in there, and the Filipinos attacked them on horseback. And we ate the horses, and the, the, that group of scouts from the Philippines, and the, uh, they were pr practically wiped out. And, uh, but uh, they kept the, the, the bridges and stuff open until our tanks got across. And, uh, 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 and, and, then, and then they had the, the infantry, the Philippine infantry, whenever there was a hot spot, that uh, uh, they, they'd bring them. American and Filipino forces became increasingly confused. MacArthur ordered his troops to fall back on Bataan. Somebody gave the order to uh, start uh, marching towards Manila. We then moved down into uh, the Bataan Peninsula. This uh, retreat was... Uh, being handled very nicely. It looked like it was a well-organized retreat down from Lingayen Gulf down into the Bataan Peninsula. Just, it uh, just seemed like it was mathematically correct. The only thing they, nobody brought any food along. The defense of the Philippines is terribly executed. It was probably impossible to ever defend it to begin with. The original defensive plan for the Philippines, approved by the War Department, and one which the forces in the Philippines uh, practiced and were prepared to execute, 
was basically to abandon the Philippines with the, not try to hold everything, but protect the vital spot, which was Manila Bay, because that is the anchorage that the U.S. Navy would eventually need if it was going to come to the rescue. The hopes of the Philippines and all America now rested on the tired, haggard men who fell back into the Bataan Peninsula. There, they grimly awaited the Japanese onslaught. They would not have long to wait. General Homa, the Japanese commander, actually had fewer troops besieging Bataan than the Americans had on the peninsula. However, they were better trained overall and supported by nearly unchallenged air and naval forces. The Bataan was a peninsula. We put a line across that peninsula with the, we had the 31st Infantry there and the Air Force didn't have uh, uh, any airplanes, so they made them infantry and they were up there, but none of those were uh, trained very well for, uh, except the 31st Infantry. And I was one of the few guys, I had learned to hunt and everything when I was a kid. My dad had chilled me. There was about a half a dozen of us that uh, were, had had quite a bit of experience with rifles and the rest of them hadn't. Here they'd come through the Army, through basic, everything, they'd never fired any kind of a weapon in their life. And they were to go out and shoot against Jap infantry that were experts. We were in sad shape. We knew nothing about infantry fighting. We were totally inexperienced in infantry fighting. We just, uh, we had rifles issued to us and uh, we knew how to uh, work them, but uh, we knew nothing about tactics. We were, uh, we didn't have any uh, uh, training as uh, infantry. We were, uh, had training climbing poles and stuff like that and uh, running telephone lines and stuff like that. General Homa's troops attacked the center of U.S. Filipino positions in mid-January 1942. windows and watch it at night we could hear it and we could hear the uh, big guns of course and we could see the flashes of light already short of supplies the inexperienced u.s and filipino forces held the japanese for almost two weeks before the position was broken when general hama's japanese forces began their attack on the main american defensive line on the Bataan peninsula they discovered that the going was really tough. The Americans were dug in and fighting hard. After two weeks of fighting, the Japanese found a way through by pushing over a mountain that the Americans had failed to defend strongly enough. Then the Americans were forced to fall back to their second line, and here there was no way around. The Japanese had no choice but to make head-on assaults, um, which were costly and, at least for a while, ineffective. Both sides were now exhausted racked with illness and short on food, medicine, and ammunition. However, the Japanese were able to bring in reinforcements and more supplies, while the Americans and Filipinos could only make do with what they could find. We were on very short rations, ate up the pack mules and the horses and carabao and everything else was there. There was a bunch of Filipino Civilians got down on the peninsula as well, so we, they had to be fed. But we only ate twice a day, and it didn't amount to much. And we had to live mainly off of the land. And so we would go out in little hunting parties to get something to eat and also to get uh, the snipers. And we had some very interesting experiences with the snipers. The three of us were sitting under a tree waiting for a bunch of chickens to come out where we could get them. And uh, the fellow in the middle got a uh, bullet through his forehead and the sniper was in a tree right above us. And of course, we didn't get the chicken. As the situation deteriorated further, General MacArthur was ordered out by the president. 
Though most of the soldiers understood the reasoning, the bitterness about his departure is still with them. No, nobody had much use for him, really. He was arrogant. Dug out Doug. I didn't like him at all. He, uh, he came over to Bataan once, I think, for about 15 minutes, right back out to the corregidor, down the tunnel. It all depends who you're talking with. I don't think he deserved the name Dug Out Doug, because if you look over his record in World War I, he did some very courageous things. But uh, he did spend a lot of time in Corregidor, in the towns of Corregidor. But I think one thing that bothered people a little bit was a statement that I shall return. Everyone was thinking, well, why couldn't he have used the plural? And then he was so melodramatic that uh, it, I think it rubbed an awful lot of people the wrong way. To break the stalemate, the Japanese tried a series of small amphibious landings on the coast of Bataan, which were countered by the defenders. They would try to attack us, and we would counterattack them, but we wouldn't, we didn't know the terrain, and they, neither did they, and we didn't realize for a little while that there was a sharp gully that went right up to the middle of the point. And they were coming up this gully, and they would attack our headquarters and our rear. And while we were chasing them towards the point, then we'd come back, and they'd go back down the gully, and we wouldn't know what was going on. Uh, it was nip and tuck, and it was, it was pretty fierce all the way around. And uh, we finally drove them over the cliff down on the line. They stayed uh, hid down there in caves along, and uh, we were on top of the bluff. It wasn't a high bluff. They were all dug in, and uh, uh, they had a cave over the hill where they could go back to, and foxholes and everything, and uh, you just couldn't get them out. We tried several different uh, approaches, and they didn't, uh, they didn't work. So my squadron commander, uh, Captain Dyes, he uh, got this idea of putting together a flotilla of uh, boats and uh, mounted 50 calibers on them and uh, uh, our flotilla opened fire on the caves. They apparently radioed in uh, air support so uh, our guys came under a, a dive bomber attack. Uh, a few casualties in that. but. Uh, it did do the job. We, uh, we eliminated the Japanese in the caves. But the bad part of the whole thing is we were cleaning out, and they, we were told not to take any prisoners. So if we saw one we thought was still alive, why most of them were dead, why we'd shoot him. Then on the 3rd of April, General Homa launched a new offensive. After fierce but brief resistance, the line cracked and Bataan was finished. On Good Friday, uh, they decided that they would launch their attack. And they did. They put everything they had into it, uh, and it didn't work. Our boys in the front line stopped them. And no matter how hard they tried, our guys saw to it that they didn't come through. The attacks by General Homa's troops against the second line on Bataan proved to be uh, futile at first. Uh, it was only after a Japanese captain uh, find a, found a small gap and managed to infiltrate his company through that the line was broken. However, once that line was broken, the Japanese found that there was virtually nothing behind it to hold them up. And the guys were just flat worn out. Everybody was. But. Uh, uh, General King, Major General King, realized that that was the end of the line, and uh, so he arranged to surrender the, uh, our forces on Bataan. We had the news that night, that evening, and it was all over the camp. It just swirled around through the camp. Bataan is gone. The American commander had surrendered to prevent a useless slaughter. 
When the forces on the Bataan Peninsula surrendered, the Japanese were unprepared for the numbers of prisoners that would confront them. Following the American surrender on Bataan, the Japanese are amazed to discover they have three times more American prisoners than they ever imagined that they would have. And so they lack medical facilities, they lack food, they lack transportation for all these prisoners. And that coupled with the brutality of the Japanese guards and a desire for revenge, uh, all these factors together create the situation that becomes known as the Bataan Death March. When Bataan surrendered, they thought the war was practically over. But they were very upset with us and we were the lowest possible thing that a human being could be because we had been surrendered. That evening, the bunch that I was in, we left and marched most all night, except for a few rest periods. There was about 200 of us in the bunch. Nobody knew where we were going or, or why or anything, but uh, uh, a couple of days later, uh, I got to uh, San Fernando, I just barely made it, and I was, uh, you know, you, you get to where you're about ready to faint and everything, and I hadn't. Uh, I'd stole one egg on the way since that can of tomatoes, and that was about 11 days it took me to, uh, uh, to, to make that uh, trip when I got to San Fernando. And, uh, uh, and, and one place, they fed us on that, a bowl of rice. So I had an egg and a can of tomatoes, and a bowl of and a rice ball in, in that 11 days. And Corregidor had refused to surrender at that time. They were still fighting out on Corregidor. Across a narrow strait, the defenders of Corregidor watched and waited for the Japanese onslaught. It came in the form of shelling and air raids. For over a month, the tiny island was subjected to a terrific bombardment. The last days of the Battle of Corregidor we had uh, lost our water and our electricity, and we were nearly out of all kinds of ammunition and, uh, and food. And uh, they said, well, they're going to invade us. The enemy's going to land now, so you guys that can, get down there on the beach. The Japs were landing on Craigador barges, and, and there, there was one of our four anti-aircraft guns that we could uh, shoot at them with, and they shot it until the breech block jammed <laughs> from the heat. They let down the front uh, gates on their barges, and the enemy started coming ashore with their shouts and yells. And we who were there uh, started firing back the best we could. And I was in between two dead Marines. And uh, so I shot up all of my rifle ammunition, plus all of my uh, pistol ammunition and uh, threw my hand grenades, and they were still coming. And as a light would go up every once in a while, uh, we could see that they were all around us. And then I couldn't decide what to do. I thought, well, how do I continue the fight? I don't have anything to fight with. We got credit for a lot, a lot of jabs that morning. They ran up the white flag at noon on Craigador, and Fort Hughes both, all, all the other islands too in the bay, and they got made us all stand up, and put our hands behind our heads and or up in the air, and they went around collecting wristwatches and rings and whatever else they wanted. And uh, that was a very sad time to have that flag come down. I'll never forget that. <laughs> 